I'm Louisa Hutton, an architect. I'm in partnership with Matthias Saarbrook and others and have been in Berlin for 27 years, always with a foot in London, and we've built three museums. I first met Martin Roth when he was based in Dresden, and more recently when I was on the jury for the V&A East in Stratford, East London. I much respected his extremely broad understanding of culture, as well as his consideration of the museum as a tool to strengthen civil society. Exhibitions should encourage us to ask important societal questions. Indeed, society, and with it our understanding of democracy and how we live together, seems to be changing faster since Rhodes' death three years ago than even he might ever have imagined. And of course, as our communities transform themselves, so must museums. Read the challenges and opportunities for museums of the 21st century, I will discuss the relationship between the digital and the tangible. And in this, the power that architecture has in the creation of physical place and particular aura. Monica Grutters, the Secretary of State for Culture and Media here in, in Germany, reminded us recently that democracy is not a possession, but an achievement that should be continually defended. Indeed, it needs non-stop artificial respiration. I quote roughly, the freedom of art provides the life oxygen that is necessary for democracy. Art and culture are not just distractions from our everyday realities, but form an indispensable part of our individual, as well as communal, confrontation with our human existence, giving us an indispensable tool when we think about what it means to be alive. This is even more salient at times such as these when the fragility of our collectively held certainties is suddenly exposed. And now, three months later, finding ourselves still deeply immersed in all the uncertainties that COVID-19 brings us, oh, sorry, COVID-19 brings us, worries that Grutters fittingly compared to the paralyzing anxieties of the migrants in Petzold's 2018 film, Transit, we are all fully aware that it's not just the individual experience of art and culture that is important, but rather the collective participation in concerts, talks, exhibition visits, and cultural visits of all times. For the individual experience of culture can, to a certain degree, as we've all found out, be made virtually as we escape the narrowness of our own being through our screens and search engines, as well as books, of course. But the collective experience illustrated, of course, perfectly by today's Zoom symposium, that when pronounced in German, sounds as if the Greeks might have already thought of it as a Zoomposium, although, of course, the wine drinking and with it the conviviality remains sadly virtual. And as we miss, crucially, contact with each other, humans are social creatures, we thrive on exchange. Of course, it is always a pleasure to visit an exhibition alone, to have the place to oneself, to be able e to even more fully immerse oneself into the subject matter, engaging with ideas that may be totally new to one or shown in a new light. But museums are also places of encounter with other people. They do not merely provide opportunities for dialogue with the exhibits. They supply meeting places for both formal and informal gatherings that are free of commercial pressure through all sorts of events and activities, including increasingly programs for both adult and children's education. So each museum provides its own physical experience, its own specific atmosphere. This is a totally non-translatable, not possible to mediate authentic encounter that takes place either through one's personal involvement with any particular artwork possibly in an intimate setting, or as a coming together with others by chance or design in the exhibition gallery, the lecture theater, the cafe, or any other social space. So it is the physical stuff of buildings that provides the backdrops for this sustenance of our individual and collective identities. And it's therefore the specific qualities of museum architecture that supplies us with memorable atmospheres, that is with corporeal experiences that become literally embedded in our bodies and so, and so stay with us for a long time, as opposed to the fleeting nature of the digital experience. Museums are public places, spaces and places, indivisible parts of the public realm. Now that they have been clearly knocked off their 19th century pedestals, 
They should be as accessible as possible. That is highly visible in their respective cityscapes with welcoming entrances and other outside-inside places before the exhibition or event spaces start. In this respect, I have the lovely triple Turkish observation that Neil McGregor, who includes free entry, as I do, into the question of accessibility, that he made in a public conversation about her Brandhorst museum, museum in Munich. His point was that for a museum that happens to be located on Turkish Street and that hosts the fantastic series of 12 panorama paintings by Twombly of the Battle of Lepanto, the last hand-fought sea battle in the late 16th century between Christians and Ottomans, should be freely accessible and indeed inviting to all Turks of Munich and elsewhere. A second example is London's Royal Academy, where the success of the new entrance at Burlington Gardens by David Chipperfield, whose nice informality, when compared to the august courtyard of Burlington House's Piccadilly entrance, has changed the way that the RA can operate and is perceived, particularly by its young audience, this welcome in the city should ideally be linked to an external public space of some generosity and amenity where people can gather or just hang out without need for consumption. And there should be a synergetic relationship between such an outside place and the spaces and activities of the museum itself, each mutually reinforcing the other. Regarding the experience of the museum itself, there are the spaces for encountering people that should be low threshold, ideally open outside museum hours, while those spaces for encountering art must allow a focus of intention. attention. Unlike our digital screens, where with ever-creasing impatience we swipe information away to find something newer, more tantalizing. Regarding this offer of focus, one should aim for an intimacy in personal encounter with the artifact. One thinks of, the Lina, Mo of Lina Bobardi's Maspa in Sao Paulo, where the visitor was directly confronted with the artwork on individual glass walls, or of Taniguchi's wonderful museum in Tokyo's Ueno Park, or indeed Scarpa's Castle Vecchio. So my first question, to what extent should the architecture of the museum be particularly expressive in the often already cacophonous urban realm? In our digitally dominated era, does it need to be more expressive than possibly was necessary or desirable to date so that you would easily remember the building, whether you see it in real or virtual space? And is such memorability just for the benefit of marketing and branding as opposed to aiding one's own memory of which exhibition one has seen? It should, of course, not be willful for, for attention's sake. A museum's architectural expression must relate to its content and make sense in the city as for any building. My second question, will we need to conceive the interior architecture, its organization, materiality, and its photogenic qualities anew in a world dominated by the screen and virtual museum visits? And what are the implications of social distancing? As COVID-19 continues to instruct that our much cherished contact with one another is denied, can the physicality, the aura, the spirit of architecture with its light, with its texture, with its hapticity provide some sort of solace? To conclude, I find that the traditional pairings, oppositional pairings of analog versus digital, local versus international or global can be turned into opportunities. Now we can have both, the actual, I would say the authentic, and the virtual, so we should exploit the, exploit the benefits of these together. Unlike the digital, though, architecture takes time to commission, plan, and build. Lastly, as museums offer a broadening of our horizons, an expansion of our consciousness of this earth and our particular place within it, so museum architecture should contribute to our curiosity about the world and how we can each contribute to it. To do this, museums need to continuously reinvent themselves, just as we do as individuals, adapting to life as it unfolds. They need to attract ever and new and ever younger audiences, being aware of their responsibility as places of education and democracy. I look forward to your questions, any questions you may have in the deep dive to come. Thank you.